The Crossover, Bridging Gaps Between Jews and Christians. In these days of violent religious and ethnic conflict, the Judeo-Christian foundations of our country need to be strengthened by uniting Jews and Christians on their commonalities and with their God. The Crossover brings intriguing, dramatic testimonies and timely topics with a variety of guests discussing the Bible, fact or fiction, the Hebraic roots of Christianity, Judaism 101, the Promised Land, Creed and Deed, the Feasts of the Lord, and Never Forget, stories of Jewish and Christian martyrs and their liberators past and present. Shalom. I'm Rosalie and welcome to The Crossover. Today we have a very special guest on our show, Paul Wilbur. He is an internationally renowned integrity music artist and he's going to be talking about worship. You're going to get a taste of some of his music. You're going to get to listen to other people and their experience of when they're in these worship events. Stay tuned. Here's Mitch and Paul. We know you do a lot of concerts, big stadiums like uh, you did there and tonight what you did here and live in Jerusalem and, and, and all that you do, Madison Square Garden, if mm -hmm. I remember. When the night is done, what is, what's your criteria for determining if that was a, a successful concert's a bad word, but for the, for the viewers, they know what a concert is. So what's, mm -hmm. what's Paul Wilbur's criteria when the night is done? Mm, that's a good question. Um, for me, I want to know that we really touched the heart of God. I'm, um, I'm not a song leader. I'm not an artist. I consider myself to be a, a worship leader. And so my greatest joy in life is not only experiencing the manifest presence of God for myself, but helping other people to connect in their lives with God so they can hear his voice and they can see what he's calling them to do and, and how much he loves them. So at the end of the night, if I know that we've really connected with the Spirit of God, uh, people have been born again, bodies have been healed, we've experienced the joy in the presence of God, and how do you judge that? You just know. When, when someone walks into a room, you know that there's another person there, there's a presence there. And knowing that manifested presence of God and sensing his well done, you know, like a father would say to a son, good job, son, I'm proud of you. Um, I, I have to say that doesn't happen every time, um, but tonight it sure did. And before I put my head on the pillow, I said, thank you, Lord, that you are good to your word. You inhabit the praises of your people and you allowed us to experience some of that tonight, some of the goodness of the Lord. That's my criteria. Did we really get a hold of him tonight, to know him and to make him known? A few years ago, there was a meeting a little bit larger than this one on the top of Mount Carmel. Pardon me. The prophets of Baal, all 400 of them gathered up there because Elijah had just about had it with religion. The people of Israel were confused. They didn't know who God was. They'd forgotten about the one who brought them through the sea. They'd forgotten the one who fed them every day with manna from heaven. They forgot the one who healed their bodies, restored their lives. They began to light fires and bow down to sticks and stones. And the prophet had had just about enough. You know, there's the prophet of the voice that's rising up again in America. The voice of the watchman had just about enough of carnal worship, forgetting the one who established our nation in righteousness, the one who sustained us, the one who prospers us, the one who gives us every breath that we draw. Well, Elijah called together the prophets of Baal and he said, you build your altars, sing your songs, dance your dances, fly your flags. I'll do the same and the God who answers by fire, let him be God. We're living in a day. The God who answers by fire, let him be God. And so the prophets of Baal set up their altars 
And they sang and danced all day long, but the heavens were silent. And then about the time of the third offering, Elijah the prophet stood forward. He lifted up his hands and he said, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you alone are God. And fire fell from heaven, consumed the offering, consumed the wood and the stones and the dust. It consumed the great amount of water that filled the ditch that had been dug around the altar of the prophet. And the people of Israel fell on their face, and with one voice they declared, The Lord! jazz musician. My mother played the violin in the symphony, and I've done both those kinds of work. So uh, other than praise and worship music, I do listen to good, uh, solid Brahms and Bach and Beethoven. And now tonight, somehow you got a front row seat. I don't know how you work that out, but you were at a Paul Wilbur event, and uh, what did that mean to you? Not the front row seat, but the, the Paul Wilbur experience here. Well, uh, I've been listening to him for a long time, and so hearing it in person, uh, the music just uh, was very powerful, uh, really uh, got me moving, and, and normally I move only with my hands and playing the drums, uh, but tonight I was, I was physically moving with the music and, uh, and up, but uh, I would say what really moved me the most with Paul's music was not even the music, but how he intermingled his uh, presentation of Scripture and his heart for the Lord and his heart for the mission that he has in the world in spreading the word, the, the messianic word. But uh, that moved me tremendously. And, and uh, for, if for anything else, I, would, uh, I was more moved by that, actually, than the music that I heard. The music, I just wanted to play with him, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, he was so good. But his heart for the Lord just really came through for me tonight. I shared tonight that there was a mosque in, um, in the nation of Zambia that the, the head, the, the pastor, if you will, called an imam, uh, was watching this group of believers feed children on the streets without discriminating between Christian, Muslim, or nothing, no faith at all. He was so moved by that, he said, this must be the truth. And so he comes down out of the mosque. Now, this may sound unbelievable to someone saying, oh, you're making this up. This is too <laughs> fantastic to make up. I mean, you couldn't even dream stuff like this. But he came down out of the mosque. He talked with the young man, the, the Messianic pastor, who was feeding uh, all these people. And he said, why are you doing this? You don't discriminate between Muslims and Christians. And, and this young man, 27 years old, shared the gospel very simply with this Muslim cleric who turned over his life to the Lord, got born again. 
he, he turned from the God of Islam and he turned to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And still some people may be saying, come on. But it's really true. I spoke with the man personally and this actually happened. The next day, this imam, who is now a believer <clears throat> in God, calls a meeting at his mosque, gives his testimony. He's one day old in the Lord. Gave his testimony, shared the gospel, and over 200 people in his mosque received the Lord that day. They all went down to the river, uh, inhabited by crocodiles, by the way. This is Zambia in Africa. And they were all immersed in water. Over 200 of them that day received the Lord. They went back to the mosque, took the crescent off, put up a star of David, and declared, we are a messianic synagogue. How's that for the power of God? Only God, but God. <laughs> Arise and shake the earth so mightily. Send your glory all across the land. walk away from that, what, what would you share with our audience uh, in this worship experience? Uh, I, I would say it was just really an awesome encounter with the Holy Spirit, and uh, I think it's a foretaste of what heaven's going to be like. I mean, there's going to be dancing, and there's going to be shouting. Now, this was another thing about the Hebraic thing, uh, getting involved in dancing. I mean, for a Baptist, this was outrageous, but we've come into dancing. We have dancing in, in our church. And it's just, the Bible says, you know, the psalmist said, let all that is within me praise his holy name. So when you come to a concert like this, you're lifting your hands, you're, I mean, it has all the charismatic movement had, but it's got the Hebraic dimension on top of that. So we're getting closer and closer to heaven. And so I think <laughs> a little bit like we used to sing this, this song years ago, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. So I kind of feel like that's what happened tonight. Thank you. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known. Reveal the glory of the living God. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known. scripture that said God inhabits the praises of his people, would that be adequate description of, of the experience tonight? 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, Paul Wilbur, I mean, the whole service was so anointed, you really could not call it a concert because uh, the presence of the Lord was so uh, there with us. And uh, really, he just ushered in. Uh, you, you just really came right into the throne room and were able just to, to bow before the Lord and uh, receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit there tonight. Uh, Pastor Marion, when in your life, doing praise and worship or dance or any of the other uh, forms of worship that there are, is there any one experience or moment that you could recall that it changed you, that um, it was through praise and worship you got an answer, you got a, um, something dramatic happened? Yes. <laughs> I, I have always enjoyed music. I've always enjoyed uh coming before the Lord in, in worship. But um, really, when we moved into the Messianic movement, there was a kinship. Uh, a, it was like I was coming home. And it truly brought me into uh, the presence of the Lord in a way that I'd never been before. And I just thank the Lord because I really feel like, um, you know, the music like uh, Paul spoke about and sang about tonight uh, is, is what the heart of Yeshua is all about. It's, it's uh, Jesus reaching down to his people and um, to be able to sing and worship in that manner, uh, it's like just getting a little taste of heaven before you get there. <laughs> so when you started getting into the Hebraic roots of Christianity, did praise and worship change in your church? Is, is that a, something that you can see? or under, Does that question have any merit? Yes, uh, most definitely our praise and worship changed. In, in and, what way? Uh, From well, before to after? I think, uh, number one, uh, Hebraic worship, uh, praise and worship, is so filled with the Word. I mean, it is. It's so connected with the Word. Uh, and it's so expressive. Uh, you know, you, you couple that with the Holy Spirit, and you just uh, are so free to express your longing to be in His presence, your longing to connect with Him, your need to have him be there, um, to be able to dance, to lift your hands with joy. To, uh, it's, it's such a wonderful way to express the joy of the Lord that I was never able to do before. So. Yvonne, tonight you were at a concert, Paul Wilbur, and um, Scripture says that uh, God inhabits the praises of his people. Did that scripture come to life tonight or, or, or not for you? Uh, yes, it certainly did because um, just the freeness of the audience, uh, including myself, to just participate in what was happening, um, the singing and uh, for some the dancing and the shouting, it was quite special. We will shout for joy. We're with Greg Shoemake tonight, and Greg is the keyboard uh, man, artist, with uh, travels with Paul Wilbur from uh, state to state, nation to nation, continent to continent, and just sharing that awesome music that, that, you, that you heard tonight. Without a word, God does speak to us in many ways, and, and uh, you have on, on, on Paul's website is the word that God gave you for 2006, and it's kind of labeled in Isaiah 50 people. Mm -hmm. And share with us, to our, our audience out there, what, what, what is that about? Well, 
at the time, if I could just at the time as I was I was in the library, it was it was a very surprising thing that it, that had occurred. Um, I hadn't even planned on receiving a word. I wasn't in a time of prayer or what have you. I was simply writing the article for the monthly newsletter, and all of a sudden the presence of the Lord just kind of landed on me, if you will, and I began to write this word down. And the the context of the Isaiah 50 people. Uh, is actually list, listed there in the Word, and it says, um, uh, talking about the anointing of the generals of worship it is increasing in this hour or in, the, in this new year. And those generals of worship who have ears to hear and hearts to obey, they will be given a mantle of boldness to press. They, and this is, the, this is the context. They will be given faces like flint, as was the case in the prophetic word concerning Yeshua in Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 11. In the Word... The faces like Flint was necessary because I really sensed that the Lord was saying this new move that he's doing for this year, this is a pivotal time in the spirit and that there are people, as a matter of fact, there was a word tonight that, uh, that, some, that many people were waiting for assignments. God is handing out new assignments tonight and that, uh, you know, that, that word and uh, the mantle. And that was actually part of, that's, that's what the Lord had given me earlier this year. And... The faces like Flint, it means that, you know, the word says that, that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And this is the part that literally, I mean, I was physically trembling as I was writing this word in the library because the thought of what was coming to the body of Christ, to the people who are going to stand strong in what God is desiring to release, what God is desiring to do, that a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, of course, the world's not going to like it. They're going to hear it, and they're going to be upset about it, and so forth, and they're going to respond. But the Isaiah fifty four eleven part was that the people who are stepping into this, they're going to have faces like Flint because the people that are coming, that are going to come against them, the strongest are going to be from the body, not going to be from the world. The greatest wow. resistance to what the Lord is doing from is good. It's going to come from the body. Right. You know, because it, and it's those people who are, who who are just not wanting to. You know, you're messing up my status quo. You're messing up my comfort zone. But it's like God is going to mess up the comfort zone to his, to release His comfort zone. And the people who who uh, he who he has handpicked uh, to to step into this, they're going to have faces like Flint, as as was listed in Isaiah 50. They are going to they're gonna they're gonna say come. Come whatever, come what may, I am not going to deter from following hard after God, after his face, not just his hand, getting past his hand to seek his face, getting past his hand to seek and know his heart. And I'm going, I'm not going to give that up no matter what you say. And it's almost like, it's almost as if that Isaiah 50 people are going to be, they're going to have the attitude of, I love you. I love you. I don't, I don't, I'm not angry with you. I'm not upset with you, but you must understand I cannot turn away from what the Father has put before my eyes. I must go on. Like Jesus, like Yeshua, he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. And you can't go to Jerusalem. You cannot stop me. I'm not, I, don't, I love you, disciples, but I'm not going to deter from what has been set before me. And this is the Isaiah 50 people. Uh, it's a people that really hasn't, you know, it, it, it's like throughout the, the, the years and the generations, it's been little specks of people. It's not been a massive amount of people okay. who are going to be that way, but this is that time when it's going to be more than just a couple people here and there. It will be a generation of people who are going to set their faces like Flint and not give up on what God has called them to do and to become. I really believe that what God is releasing is an anointing in and through worship. Yeah. You, know, and, you know, he rides on the praises of his people, and so he is building, and has been, I should say, he has been building up to this point. He has been building in the background the hearts of those people who he has he can entrust, yes. you know, that will carry this anointing that you know that will allow him to ride on these praises. And where he is exalted, his word will have the final jurisdiction. Yes. And so what he's been doing is behind the scenes he's been cultivating these hearts, these worship generals, and he's declaring that now is the time. Last question, uh, Greg is. Since we're talking about worship and your praise and worship leader in general mm -hmm. also, sure. and uh, what is your definition of worship? That's kind of a large, large question. But for me personally, 
among other things, <laughs> how, how can I put it? Except to say, it's the, t it's the time when, when I and the Lord can become one in that, in that moment of expression. It's, if I can use this, this analogy, it's almost like an intimacy with him like I have with my wife. There is a oneness that, that comes. There's a vulnerability that occurs in worship. And the wild thing about it is it's not just me becoming vulnerable, but him becoming vulnerable. It's like Moses, like Paul sings a song, Show Me Your Face. We sing that song, Show Me Your Face. But it's, it's, it's almost as if in worship, it's not just us saying, Lord, show me your face, but it's him saying, show me your face. Mm. Adam, Adam, where are you? You know, God knew where Adam was, mm -hmm. but it was a time for Adam to respond, to, to willfully come to the face of the Father. And God was giving him that opportunity. In worship, I have that opportunity to come face to face with him and enjoy him and him and he enjoy me. How wild is that? Yeah. That he wants to enjoy me as much as I want to enjoy him, actually much more than I ever want, I ever could imagine. So worship to me is a mutual enjoyment of the Lord and uh, the Lord, the, cre the creator and the creation. Well, you guys definitely do that and we get to enter in <laughs> by you facilitating that event here, especially yeah, tonight. Well, thank you, Greg, for taking some time and, and coming on the crossover, and we only thank wish you. you the best and bless your ministry. And, you, and I hope that there was something on today's program that has touched your heart in some way and has inspired you to enter into the presence of the Lord through song, through dance, through music. For those of you who want more information about today's program, please contact us at The Crossover, www.thecrossovertv.com. We'd love to hear from you as well. Shalom. The Crossover, an award-winning program bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. For your comments, more information on today's or other Crossover programs, or if you would like to support this effort, contact us at 713-639-2888. We want to hear from you.